If you'll just look for him, he's there. Amen. Remain standing just a moment longer. Uh, I'm thankful for the revival that has taken place at the Life Church. And we're seeing it in different ways. Four, four baby girls dedicated today. So we're seeing it in the physical. Hallelujah. I'm wondering how many we're going to have here in the next few months. Maybe there'll be some COVID babies. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Let the church grow one way or the other. But we're not just growing in the physical. I'm thankful for that. But spiritually as well, people are receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Several in the last few weeks, Friday night, Kaylee Dungan received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She's up in kids' life right now. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. We baptized one after first service today. We've got at least one to be baptized after today's service. So why don't we just give the Lord a good hand clap, recognizing what he is doing. Amen. To God be the glory. We plant, we sow, but it, it's God who gives the increase. It's God who gives the increase. Amen. Grab your Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Job. And I'm starting a two-week series today, calling this series Deep and Wide. Deep and Wide. And this is a, a thought, a theme, a concept that I've been referencing for a few months now. I've spoken just in passing about this and prayer gatherings and devotions and services and meetings with various team members and groups. And in light of what Pastor Gurley preached last Sunday and some things my pastor, Daryl John, shared with me last year, I feel led to, to preach this now and we'll preach today and next week kind of on this theme. Job 28 and 1 is where we'll go. And before I, before I get to the text, let me just tell you, and this goes right with what I'm preaching to you today, but God, God has birthed something in this church in the realm of prayer in, in the last several months. And we really all got to experience it together on Wednesday nights in uh, the early part of January and through our 21 days uh, of prayer. And I announced Wednesday night that this Wednesday night I was going to start a new series on the gift, gifts of the Spirit, but I'm going to delay that for a week and I talk with our pastoral team and just feel like that for the rest of the year, we're going to take the first Wednesday night of the month and we're going to worship and we're going to pray. And we're just going to continue each month, first Wednesday, each month of the year, we're just going to let God continue to, to work in our lives and let him continue to deepen some things in the spirit. Amen? Praise God. I'm looking forward to Wednesday night. I'm looking forward to you being here and God working in a great way. Job 28 and 1. I'm going to read two verses. I'm going to read verse 1 and verse 12, and then I'll kind of go back in my message and backfill so you don't have to stand for the reading of all 12 verses now. I'll read the bookends. Verse number 1 of Job 28 says, Surely there is a mine. Everybody say a mine. A mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Surely there's a, there's a mine for silver, a place where you find gold. Verse 12, but where can wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding? Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Deuteronomy 4 and 29 says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God. And you will find him if you do what? If you seek him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Jeremiah 29, 13 tells us, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Isaiah 55 and 6 says it like this, Seek the Lord while he may be found and call on him while he is near. Acts 17, 27 tells us that his purpose was for the nations to seek after God. If you want to know what he wants for the United States of America, he wants us to seek him. 
Do you want to know what he wants for the nations of this world? He, his desire, his, what, he, what his plan is, is for us to seek after God. And perhaps we would feel our way towards him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So church, the point that I'm trying to drive home at the outset of this message today is that God wants to reveal himself. If you will let him, God wants to reveal himself to you. He's kind of like that kid playing hide and seek. They don't stay in that hiding place, do they? But many times when you come around, they, they pop out from behind the couch. They pop out from behind the chair. Here I am. And that's how God is. If you will seek him, he wants to be found. He desires to be known. But you're only going to find him if you make up in your mind and purpose in your heart that you are going to seek him. Can somebody say amen? amen. In our text, in the midst of Job's suffering, he was reflecting on the value systems of life, he was thinking and he was pondering about, you know, what, what's really important, what, what really matters in this life. And so Job began to describe how humans, how men and women, how people mine precious metals, how, how we dig and we find stones from deep in the earth, and, and, and that's where you're going to find gold, and that's where you're going to find silver, and that's where you're going to find beautiful, costly, valuable gems. It's not on the surface. You're not going to be walking around, you know, one day and all of a sudden see, you know, a chunk of gold there on the sidewalk. That, that's not where it is. You, you've got to go beyond the surface. You've got to be willing to dig down deep. You, you, you've got to be willing to break up the ground a little bit. Yes, there's treasure under there. There's something of worth that can be found, that is to be found there under, under the surface and under the crust of the earth. But you've got to understand today that things of value, things like silver, things like gold, they must be mined. They must be dug out. Things of worth aren't found in shallow places. Let's go back to our text, Job 28, verse 1. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth. Where? From the earth. From inside the earth. That's where you find valuable metals. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Where do you find ore? You find it in the earth. Man puts an end to darkness and searches every recess for ore in the darkness and the shadow of death. He breaks open a shaft. All of these mining terms that are going on here, it's in the earth, and there's a, there's a shaft, and it's away, away from people. It's not where everybody else lives. It's not in those places where everybody else dwells, but it's, it's in the earth, and it's away from people. It's in places forgotten by feet, and they hang far away from men. They swing to and fro. Verse number five, and as for the earth, from it comes bread, but underneath it, there's something different than bread underneath it. And it's turned up as by fire. And its stones are the source of sapphires. That's what you're going to find underneath the surface. That's what you're going to find beyond the shallows. You're going to find sapphires. It contains gold dust. That, that path that no bird knows. The bird's up in the air flying overhead. Nor has the falcon's eye seen it. The proud lions, they walk over top of it. They don't even know it's there. They're just walking over top of it, nor has the fierce lion passed over it. He puts his hand on the flint. He overturns the mountains at the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks, and his eyes see every precious thing. He dams up the streams from trickling. What is hidden he brings forth to the light. And then Job asked this in verse number 12, but where can wisdom be found? I know where to find precious metals. I know where to find costly gems. But where can I find what I really need? Where can I find what I really want? Where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? You see, church, here in Job 28, we see the levels of life put on display for us. First, Job observed that in the animal world, in the animal kingdom, 
things like gold, things like silver, things like precious stones in the animal kingdom. To animals, those things don't mean anything. Gold is worthless to a cat. Silver is worthless to animals. Diamonds don't mean anything to your pets. Why? Because animals can't eat them. They're no good to them because they can't eat them. And that's what they do. They roam around. They're looking for their next meal. They're looking to satisfy their bellies. They're looking to take care of their flesh. That's what you do when you're on the animal level. And so you have no appreciation. You have no respect. You have no desire for things that are beyond, that are, that are below the surface. So Job, in his writing in the 28th chapter, he used two predators to top of the food chain predators to represent the best that the animal world has to offer. First off, Job spoke of birds of prey. He spoke of a specific bird. He spoke of the falcon. Job 28 and 7 says, that path no bird knows, nor has the falcon's eye seen it. The King James Version, if you've got that version in your hands today, it says vulture. But the New King James and the New Living Translation both say falcon. And so Job here, he is visualizing the sharp eye of a falcon, that falcon flying in the air, soaring overhead, looking for food, looking for prey, looking for what is going to be its next meal. And what you've got to know about a falcon, that a falcon wasn't chosen by happenstance, but a falcon's eye is eight times more powerful than a human eye. They see further than we could ever see. A falcon can spot small prey at a distance of two miles. They see them a long way off, and then they chart their course, and they begin diving for them. They swoop in and make the kill, and the reason they're able to do it is because of their keen eyesight. They can see things that other animals can't see. They can see things that we can't see. But think about this. For all of that falcon's predatory prowess, a bird of prey cannot see. A bird of prey has absolutely no use for gold. No use. A falcon has no understanding of the value of precious metals, has no appreciation for the value of precious stones because gold and sapphires, they are mined in the depths of the earth where birds can't go and where birds cannot mine them, nor are they even interested in them. Gold has absolutely no value to a bird. Then Job continues on. He begins to talk about the lion, the proud lion, the king of the jungle. The 8th verse of the 28th chapter, the proud lions have not trodden it, nor has the fierce lion passed over it. You see, throughout history, lions have been symbols of strength. Lions can run up to 50 miles an hour in a burst of speed. A lion can leap 36 feet in the air at one time. A lion's bite is measured at 650 pounds of bone-crushing Power per square inch. If you want to compare that, ours is about 150 pounds per square inch. And a lion's is 650 pounds. Powerful. But for all of the power, for all of the strength that a lion has, with their one and a half inch claws, with their powerful legs that they stride around on, lions don't use their power to dig for gold. They don't use their power to dig for precious hidden things. In fact, a lion could starve to death while laying on top of a stack of gold bars. Those gold bars wouldn't mean anything to that lion. All that lion wants to know is where is my next meal coming from? What's about to get in my belly? That's what that lion wants to know. The point is this, precious metals have no value in the animal world. But not so in the human world. To us, gold matters. Gold has value. Some of us would like to have a little bit of gold in our portfolio. 
We'd like to have a little bit more in our bank accounts. We'd have to like to have a little bit more in our hip pockets. It matters. And so Job observed that humans, we have the capabilities, we have the intellect to dig down below the surface. We have the ability to mine those deeper places in the earth in order to extract, in order to pull out treasures, in order to pull out things of value, in order to pull out things of worth. That's what miners did in Job's day. They searched for and they discovered gold and silver and sapphire and the sapphires. And then they would take these metals. They, they would take these gems and then they would barter with it. They, they, they would use it to buy food. They would use those precious things to buy goods, to buy what they needed to get by from day to day. That was the realm of men back in Job's day. But if we were to fast forward from Job's day to our day, humans have done some pretty cool things. Humans harness their intellect to do some pretty incredible things. We've put a man on the moon. We, we have taken quantum leaps in medicine and science and technology to the point that it is mind-boggling what we have been able to achieve. So please understand that I'm not attempting to minimize the advances of mankind today. But everything that we know and everything that we can do with our human strength, with our human ability, it is still relegated and limited to the natural realm. We live in the physical. We live in the here and now. We operate day by day in the natural realm. Because of that, there is a limit to the depths of understanding for humans just as there is with falcons, just as there is with lions. Job even seemed impressed with what man could do. But there was something else. There was something not discovered by natural human means, and he spoke about it in the 12th verse of that chapter. He said, but where, where can we find wisdom? Where can we find something beyond the animal level? Where can we find something beyond the natural human level? Where can we find wisdom? Where is that place of understanding? You see, church, the deep things of God cannot be comprehended by the best of the animal kingdom. It can't be comprehended by falcons. It can't be comprehended by lions. Human beings, yes, human beings are impressed. I'm surrounded by a bunch of impressive people today. The Bible says we're made a little lower than the angels. Just a little bit lower than the angels. But even though human beings are impressive, our best efforts to discover wisdom apart from God will fail miserably. You see, because even though there are a lot of things that we can do, there's still a whole lot that we cannot do. We can't control a hurricane. We can't even eradicate the common cold. We can't conquer moral weaknesses. We don't have a vaccine that will heal the hatred of our land. But Job said, there is a place, there is a depth in the earth where falcons can't go and where lions can't go. There's a place where wisdom can be found and it can't be mined in our minds. It can't be figured out by our intellect. It can only be revealed by the Spirit of the Almighty God. Jesus said it like this. He said to Simon Peter in Matthew 16, 17, he said, look, Simon Peter, you've just tapped into another level. You, you, you've just moved beyond the animal level and the human level. And here's what he said, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Simon Peter, but my Father who is in heaven. He was letting him know there's another dimension. He's letting him know there's another aspect. There's another level. And Simon Peter, you're getting it. It's beginning to come together for you. You're beginning to move beyond the animal instincts. You're beginning to move beyond the human level. And you're letting the spirit begin to burn some things in your life. 
Job gave us a clue with his mining illustration. Elements of great value. Elements of great value like gold. You only get them through great effort. And those, that great effort requires you to go to great depths. If you're content on the surface, you're never going to get the things of great value. If you're happy where you are, if you're not willing to begin to dig and to go down a little bit deeper and to expend a little bit of energy and to roll up your sleeves and be willing to sweat and toil, you're not going to get the things, the gifts, the blessings, the treasures, the things that God has for you that are below the surface. Just like gold is mined from the depths of the earth, so spiritual wisdom is mined from the depths of God. Hear me today, church. Shallow people do not find spiritual treasures. Spiritual riches are only found by going deep. You're going to have to go deep. If you want more of God, you're going to have to go deep. If you want a greater anointing on your life, you're going to have to be willing to begin to dig, dig into the things of the Spirit. If you want God to open your eyes in some areas, if you need revelation, if you need his guidance, you're going to have to be willing to put in the effort, to put in the work, to dig down deep where those treasures are, where wisdom can be found, where understanding is plenteous. So where's wisdom found? Job says, I'm going to read that verse again, verse 12, but where can wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. Job said, hey, it's not in the physical. You're not going to find this wisdom. You're not going to find this understanding just right here. You're not going to find it by looking around to other people and seeing, hey, what are the masses doing? What is there? How is everybody else living? You're not going to find it, he said, in the land of the living. It's not in the animal kingdom. It's not at the human level. That's not where you're going to find these things. He goes on to say, the deep says, is it not in me? And the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed for its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir and precious onyx or sapphire. And then Job asks again in verse number 20, from where then does this wisdom come? I want it. I want these deeper things, and I've got to know where I can get it. I've got to know where it comes from. So he asks, he's being repetitive, where does wisdom come from? And where? is the place of understanding then he says it is hidden from the eyes of all the living and concealed from the birds of the air people who are just living casually they're just going to be walking along and not even know what's there don't even know what's there and what's available in the depths. They don't even know just a few feet under where their feet are that there is something that is powerful. There is something that is life transforming. It's hidden from the eyes of the living. It's concealed from the birds of the air. Then referring to the Lord, Job concluded his sermon with these words. and He said in the 27th verse, then he saw wisdom and declared it. He prepared it indeed. He searched it out. If you seek for him with all your heart, if you search for him with all your heart, you're going to find it. We read that a moment ago. And to man, he said, behold, here you go. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. You see, church, you've got to be willing today to foster some good old reverence in your life for the things of God. you got to quit playing church, and you got to quit playing around with God. 
You got to quit turning it off and turning it on when it's convenient for you. But you've got to say, oh, God, you're holy. God, you're righteous. God, you made me. You're the one who breathed me into being. You're the one who has a purpose and plan for my life. I'm here because you put me here. And you can take me out whenever you choose to take me out. My life is in your hand. My breath comes from you. My being, my moving, my living, my everything. Everything. He's a sovereign God. He's not a God that we can control as men. We love remote controls, don't we? We love to push a button and something happens. But can I tell you today, you can't control God with your little remote control. He is an untamable God. He is a mighty God. He is a God of all power. He will do what he wants the way he wants to do it when he gets good and ready. So we've got to fear him. That's the beginning of wisdom. A healthy, reverential respect and fear of God. Quit toying with him. Quit being satisfied for a measure of a relationship with him. Quit running to him when you need him. And forget about him once he gives you what you need. It starts with a fear of God. It starts with a reverence. It starts with being awed. It starts with being amazed. It starts with being overwhelmed at this God that we serve. If you want wisdom today, if you want to go deeper in your relationship with God, would you just be in awe of him all over again? As a matter of fact, can we just take a little praise break right now? Can we just be in awe of our God? He's here. The God who created all is here. The Savior is here today. Oh, God, we want to tap into the deep things. We want to tap in, Lord, to a deeper depth in our walk with you. So let us see you in the way we need to see you. And let us understand you, Lord, that you are untamable. You are not like a man that you should lie. Come on, there's some treasures. Come on, there's some treasures, but will you go after it? Come on, will you be willing to push past your flesh? Will you be willing to do a little bit of digging so you can take hold of it, so you can apprehend it, so it can be yours? Come on, are you just satisfied with where you are, feeling like, hey, I'm on my way to heaven. That's all that matters. Or are you saying here today, no, if there's more that God has available to me, then I want it and I want to go after it. The second thing Job says, he says, you've got you've to depart from evil. If you want to go deep, you want to go deep with God, well, you've got you to quit protecting those hidden sins. You've got to quit doing those things you've always been doing. You, you, you've got to turn your back on the world. You, you've got to turn your back on, on the allurements of the flesh. You, you, you've got to be willing to depart from evil. You, you've got to be willing to put some things behind you once and for all. Quit circling back around to it. Quit doing like what the Bible says, like a dog returning to its vomit. Come on, you can live on the animal plane if you want to. You can live like a dog if you want to and keep on going back to that junk. You can keep on going back to that stuff, but you don't have to live on the animal plane. You don't even have to live on the human level. There is a call from the Spirit that is going out today that says, hey, you can dig deeper. There is wisdom. There is understanding. But you've got to turn your, your back on the world and the things of the flesh if you're going to take hold of them. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord right now. Hallelujah. So let me ask you right now, what level are you living on? What level? Job laid it out for us, three very distinct levels. What level are you living on? 
Because according to the word of God, according to scripture, there are humans who choose to live like animals. There are humans who live, who choose to live beneath their means and live like an animal, a wild animal. The apostle Peter wrote about those people in 2 Peter 2 and 12. He said, but these, they're like natural brute beasts. He's comparing people to brute beasts. The New Living Translation says it like this. Those who have the moral character of brute beast. Well, what's a brute beast? What he's trying to get at is that these are animals who can't really think for themselves. They're driven by an impulse. And that impulse is, I got I to gotta, I gotta get satisfied. I got to feed my belly. Uh, I've got to get my next meal. I've got to get what my flesh wants. So there are people who live like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they don't understand. Let me, let me just pause right there. And I, I, I'm sorry to say this, but sometimes we, we as Christians, we can get around certain people who've already begun to, to dig. We can, we can get around certain people who've already begun to access the gold. They've already begun to access the treasures. They've, they've already pushed past the surface, and they're tapping into the deeper things of God. And just like the scripture says, we can begin to speak evil of the things that we don't even understand. Rather than saying, hey, you know what? They're digging deeper than I am, and praise God, I might not understand it, but just because you don't understand it doesn't mean you have to destroy it. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean you have to speak evil of it. But instead, I would say let it challenge you. Hey, if there's a deeper level, if there's a deeper place, if she can go there, and if he can go there, then I want to go there. Quit tearing spiritual people down just because you don't understand what's going on and what they're tapping into. Paul referred to the Cretans as evil beasts in Titus chapter 1, verse number 12. He said, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars. They're evil beasts. Lazy gluttons. What's Paul saying? They're humans, but they're living like animals. They're humans capable of so much more, but they're satisfied just to be like the animal in the field. Psalm 73, 22, the writer referred to his own flawed, th flawed thinking like this. He said, I was so foolish. I was so ignorant. I was like a beast. I was like an animal before you. Romans 1 and 28 says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, what did God do? He gave them over to a debased mind. Let me break that down for you. What does that mean, a debased mind? It means he gave them over to an animalistic mind to do those things which are not fitting. You've got to hear me today. If you insist on living on the animal level, if you continue to make decisions Decisions like an animal makes decisions. What do I want? What do I desire? What do I need to fill my belly? If you continue to make decisions based on an animal level, you're going to get to a point where God's going to say, okay, I'm stepping back. I'm going to give you what you want. If you want that, then it's yours. And the Bible says he'll give you over to a debased mind. He'll stop convicting you. He'll stop stirring you up. He'll stop reaching for you if you continue to push past his spirit. If you continue to turn a deaf ear to his word and to ignore his pleas, he will give you over to that animal impulse. I'm not suggesting today that anyone here lives like an animal. I'm not saying if I went home with you today that I would find a pigsty in your living room. But church, our choices can be reduced to that level sometimes. 
Our choices can be animalistic in, in nature. Our lifestyles, our behaviors can be subhuman at points. So maybe today you don't live on the animal level. But let's take this a step further. Do you only live on the natural human level? You see, there are talented and educated and accomplished people all around this world who live empty and futile lives. The best of the best, the, the brightest of the brightest, and yet they're empty and they're searching and there's something missing. Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, acknowledged that in Ecclesiastes 2 and 11. Here's what he said, but as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless. I'd worked for it, I'd accumulated it, I'd gathered it to myself, but once I had what I went after, I looked at it and it didn't mean anything. He goes on to say, it was like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Verse 17 of that same chapter, he continues, so I came to hate life because everything done here under the sun is so troubling. Everything is meaningless. It's just like chasing the wind. You chase and you chase, yet you never take hold of it. But that's not what God said about the treasure that I'm speaking to you about today. That's not what God said even about himself. He said, hey, if you'll seek me, if you'll search for me, if you'll run after me, if you'll chase me, instead of chasing after the world, instead of chasing after what your flesh wants, you're going to find me. You're going to find me. Oh, somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Hallelujah. Solomon later in that same book, in the fourth chapter, in the fourth verse, he said, then I observed that most people are motivated to success. Why? Because they envy their neighbors. We do so much of what we do because we want to be like everybody else. We, we want to be like the neighbors next door. We want to have in our driveway what they have in their driveway. We want to have in our closet what they have in their closet. And we work and we work and we strive and we strive because we have this envy for everyone else. And all the while, where is everyone else living? Where is everyone else living? Where, where? They're on the surface. They're just on the surface. They're living on the surface. They're satisfied with the surface. They're satisfied with the image. They're satisfied with the possessions. They're satisfied with earthly things, and they're going about their business, living on the surface, never breaking the surface to go deep. They're living on the surface, and yet we look at them, and we want to be like, we want to be like them, and we want to have what they have. Solomon goes on to say, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. It has no value. Keeping up with the Joneses is like chasing the wind. When you have what they have, you're still going to be void. You're still going to be lacking. You're still going to be empty. But don't be discouraged today because there is another level. It's not the level of the animal world. It's not the level of the natural human world, but it's the level of the spirit. Hear me today. I'm not against intellect. I'm not against using what God has given you. But listen, I want you to know today that you cannot think yourself, you cannot think your way into being spiritual. You cannot sit and ponder your way into becoming a powerhouse from God, a, a minister of God, someone that God can use. You're not going to be able to operate in the realm of the Spirit just on your intellect. Let me tell you, you weren't born good enough to grasp the things of God, and neither was I. 
As a matter of fact, because we're not born in able, uh, uh, able to be able to tap into the Spirit, the Bible says, hey, you got to be born again. If you want to tap into that third level, if you want to move beyond the animal level, the human level, you've got to tap in to the Spirit by being born again. If you want to perceive the things of God, you've got to be born again. You weren't born. Come on, how are we born? We're born in sin. We're shaping in iniquity. That's how we're born. We're born to live on the animal level, to live on the human level at best. But if there's something aching inside of you today for meaning, for purpose, for fulfillment, you got to be born again. You got to be born again. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. He said, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they're foolish to him. Neither can he know them because the only way you can discern them is through the Spirit. The natural man, your natural man, my natural man, our flesh today, Sometimes we look at what goes on in the spirit and we say, oh, that, that, that ain't nothing necessary. Oh, that, that's a little over the top. Oh, they're getting a little too worked up. Oh, look, that's just that's too emotional for me. You know, you want to know why? Because as long as you're content to live on the natural, you'll look at the spiritual and say, that's foolish. That's uncalled for. That's not necessary. It will be foolish to you. So today, if you've not been born again, I want you to know that you can be. The things of the Spirit can come alive to you if you will allow them to. Maybe you've been born again, but you need to be renewed again. You need to be refreshed again. Maybe you, need to, maybe you need to go into that spirit level again so you can get a spiritual mindset and begin to care and value and love the things of the spirit. Come on, there's some gold. There, there, there's some silver. There's some sapphire that is buried just beneath the surface. There's some anointings in this place. There's some blessings today. There's some revelation that is available, but you've got to get hungry for it. Today, you can dig past the levels that have kept you from the treasures of God's promises. No matter who you are, there's peace for your troubled mind. That's a treasure, and it's there, and it's available, but you've got to be willing to go after it. You've got to be willing to dig for it. You, you've got to be willing to seek. You've got to be willing to search it out. Come on, if you're lacking meaning and purpose in your life, let me tell you, it's there. It's there. All you have to do is begin to seek for it, and God will readily and willingly reveal it to you. So make up your mind today. Get ready to take the plunge today. Go deep in the things of God. Would you stand with me right now, musicians, singers? get in place I wonder today as I've preached do you hear God calling you from the deep is something stirring in your spirit today is something being awakened inside of you have you gotten to the place where you can't hear him any longer have you gotten to the place where he can't knock at your heart's door and you recognize that it's him. Well, if that's the case, I wonder if we could just begin to pray right now. God, resensitize us. Come on, everybody, begin to pray. God, if you're calling, we want to hear. Lord, if you're inviting me to go deeper, I want to go. Lord, if there's something more that you have and that you want to make available to me, then I want it. I want it. I don't want to continue to go around being envious of everybody else who's living on the surface when I can dig down deep and have what I really long for and have what I really need in the things of God.
in the things of the Spirit. Come on, if you're ready to go deep, why don't you step out from where you are? Come on, if you're ready to go deep, why don't you make that place where you're standing an altar? Come on, why don't you change your posture some way right now? You've got to do something if you're going to go beneath the surface level. You've got to roll up your sleeves. You've got to engage the Spirit if you're going to push past where you are and where you've been. You've got to block what everybody else is doing out of your mind. And you've got to say, I'm going after it. It's available to me. It's valuable to, valuable to me, and I want it. So I'm going to dig it out. For you to go deeper today, maybe that means that you need to linger in prayer. Don't just pray for a moment, but pray until you break through. Pray until your flesh dies. Pray until you get a hold of God. Maybe you're going to have to press past the point of your flesh being uncomfortable when it comes to your worship. I want the deeper things. I want the deeper things. Maybe that means you're going to need to dig into the Word of God and let the Word of God begin to speak to you and change you. If you're going to dig deeper, maybe that means having some conversations with some godly people who are going to challenge you in your relationship with God. Come on. Can you hear him calling today? Can you hear him calling to you today? If you're going to go deeper, if you're going to go deeper, then maybe you're going to need to fast. You're going to choose to crucify your flesh. You're going to have to learn to get into the presence of God for yourself. To hear the voice of God for yourself. I implore you today, abandon those shallow things. Those shallow things that are restricting you. Those shallow things that are holding you back. Abandon them and launch out into the deep. Answer the call of God. Psalm says deep calls to deep. And that's what's happening here today. The deep things of God are calling to the depths within your spirit today. Would you answer? Would you respond to him? Would you wait out? You might wait out to the thankful depth like Pastor Gurley talked about last Sunday. But you can wait out till it comes up to your knees if you want to. And you can wait out in the water till it comes up to your waist. Day. Go deep with the Spirit. Holy Spirit.
Hallelujah. If you're still praying, you keep right on praying. If you want to be a part of this baptism, you're welcome to. Gia brought her entourage today. So wonderful to have the Dole family, the Frost, the Booth family with us today to celebrate this special day for a very, very special girl. I love what God is doing in our children here at the Life Church. I'm thankful for our children's leaders, kids' life directors who believe not just in that they're not babysitting, but they're leading people, they're leading those kids to have an encounter with God, to make a choice and a decision to live for the Lord for themselves. Amen. So Gia has gotten to the place and she's ready to be baptized. She knows what it's about. I've talked with her, mom and dad have talked with her, and she's taken on the name of Jesus today. And according to the word of God, she's not just going public with her faith, but here today, in obedience to her action, her sins are going to be washed away. Is anybody thankful for that? In your faith, and in obedience to the word of God, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Can the church say in Jesus' name? more comfortable leaving now you are more than welcome to otherwise